so hi everyone and welcome to the ecm goa event we are having this event after a long uh, sort of hiatus and uh, we haven't had any talk in the last couple of months for various reasons so uh, we hope that this talk will again start the regular uh, pace of having these research talks so today's talk is by dr aditya joshi who is an expert in natural language processing nlp so aditya obtained his uh, phd from iit bombay in 2018 uh, it, it is in fact in iit bombay as well as uh, in monash university i think it was it was a joint phd and in iit bombay uh, he is he was advised by pushpa patacharya uh, currently aditya works in seek it's a hr consulting company in melbourne uh, which provides employment marketplaces uh, operating across asia pacific and latin america um, it's a market leader in that segment so uh, welcome aditya to this talk and uh, we are looking forward to hearing about the applications of nlp awesome great i'll begin thanks neha so before i begin i would like to thank acm goa for this opportunity uh, my name is aditya and i'll be talking about applications of natural language processing let's first look at this picture here this picture is by an artist called kalyan joshi i saw this picture at a Mel melbourne museum surprisingly uh this picture as you can see paints the lives of uh, people in india during the covid pandemic however you'll also notice that the artist has used his skills in a very typical style of sketching or uh, painting uh, the rajasthani art and he has depicted lives of people using his skill i think this picture sets the premise for our talk today because in our in today's talk we're going to see how skills in natural language processing can be applied to different problems so that's really the title of today's talk it is applications of natural language processing specifically from a research perspective like neha said i am a data scientist at seek seek is an online employment marketplace and i work on nlp problems at seek so what is nlp or natural language processing as we know nlp is a subfield of artificial intelligence that deals with processing of language what this also means is that nlp is sometimes referred to as computational linguistics so it's really a combination of computer computer science and linguistics it aims to solve some problems in linguistics using computer science however while the focus or the initial uh, or the history of nlp is in solving linguistic problems today nlp spans fundamental linguistic research areas as well as task task oriented areas and some examples of task oriented research areas are sentiment analysis translation summarization and so on and before we really get into the details i'd just point all of you to this link called acl anthology which is a public repository of all key nlp papers so what are these research problems so nlp could deal with part of speech tagging which is shown in the example on the left where you would label individual words with their part of speech tags or it could be sentiment analysis which is a task oriented research area where you could have a sentence my experience so far has been fantastic which is predicted as positive for example so where do we see nlp we really see nlp in ways more than we acknowledge so for example if you type a query in a search engine where is the supreme court of india you actually get the address the word where is actually very ambiguous the search engine could respond to the question where is the supreme court of india with the word india because the supreme court of india is in india but it decides to give us the address similarly when i log on to a social networking website and as a post from a, 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 in a language which i don't understand the website provides me this option to see the translation which is this little button here similarly when i actually get an email from a from a friend and he wrote to me about something and he said i love this little touch by mastercard so i felt like sharing it with you we also see that email engines these days allow us to send responses automatically generated responses with click of a button so the engine understands that three possible responses to this email are love it thanks for sharing very nice etc similarly banks also provide 
customer care agents in order to make sure that they service large scale uh, customer requests at a time using an automatic uh, engine. Similarly, there's also uh, additional work in academia where uh, I'd like to highlight this uh, approach by IIT Bombay, which is a speech to speech machine translation system where you say something in a language and it gets translated to some other language. We can imagine that when there are two people in a room together who don't speak each other's languages, this can actually be very useful. And so the point I want to draw here is that the impact of NLP is in its applications. Impact of NLP is in ways in which it can be used. And that's really this, that's really what this talk is about. So today I will be introducing some applications of NLP primarily via research papers, which is why I uh, call it a research perspective. We will also understand how to conceptualize an NLP application project. We'll not necessarily discuss the details of the approach, but I'm happy to take questions related to the approach and answer them to the best of my ability. But the most important objective for me is to give a flavor of the positive utility of NLP applications. NLP applications can be used in many positive ways, just like a knife, which is a cutting instrument, can be used in positive ways, such as cooking food. But we can also think of negative applications of a cutting instrument, right? So in today's talk, I would really like to focus on what kind of positive applications of NLP exist out there, while not really, uh, let, while not really discounting the fact that we must all be mindful of the negative impact of AI or any application therein. So before we begin, let's try to understand what an application means. So the, the definition of an application is the action of putting something into operation. But really in the context of this talk, the application that I'm referring to is interdisciplinarity. So essentially interdisciplinary studies involves the combination or, of one or more fields. What I'm referring to here is shown in the diagram on the right, where we're talking about how NLP can help another field. And there are two kinds of stakeholders which one must be mindful of when looking at applied NLP or NLP applications. The first set of stakeholders are end users. Who, are going, who is going to use this application? And the second set of stakeholders are the experts, experts in the field which NLP is trying to help. And the question to ask there is how can these experts actually help what we're trying to do? And therefore, as we progress through these applications, I would really like all of you to think of who are the end users and who are the experts. And what can NLP applications achieve? Why are we really talking about this? I mean, isn't it, I mean, isn't NLP applications about just putting, calling some library and putting it on a website? Well, not really. It also has some research potential in terms of research papers or demonstration papers. In fact, NLP applications is one of the one of the broad topics which are listed in all key NLP conferences, as you see here on the right. I'll also call out that while this presentation is about research ideas, it's not far from uh, it's not difficult to imagine that these ideas can actually spur new startup and business uh, plans. But that's really not the focus of this talk. The focus of, of this talk is how NLP applications has, have been presented in terms of research. So I've divided this talk into three parts. The first part is an overview of some NLP applications. The second part leads on from the first part where I essentially will highlight some typical steps of building an NLP application. And if time permits, I'm gonna share a story of our NLP application and how we built it using these three typical steps. So let's start with the first part, which is overview of NLP applications. So over the next few slides, I'm going to describe how NLP has been applied to different areas outside of NLP. Hopefully, you will be able to imagine who the end users are and who the, state, and who the experts are. So let's start with the first one, which is NLP technology, education technology, which I thought would be the closest to our audience. So the first kind of NLP application in education technology is grammar correction. We've all used grammar, Grammarly and other apps which allow us to correct spelling mistakes and grammatical mistakes. In fact, red underlines and green underlines in applications like Microsoft Word have existed for many decades. And they are in fact, a very early application of NLP as such. 
But the research in grammar correction continues till date, as you would see in this paper that I have added in the footnote. In this paper, the authors actually propose a data weighted training strategy so that they can weight examples of common errors more than the others in order to achieve grammar correction. Similarly, in terms of ed tech or education technology, NLP has also been applied in the context of detecting student engagement. So this recent paper in LREC 2022 presents a multimodal corpus where they have eight hours of recordings of 118 participants. And the recordings have been edited, synchronized, and the student participants have been annotated for engagement. So what can this what, what, what this data set can really be used for is essentially to train a model to understand how students are engaged in particularly an online class or a, or a Zoom class or similar. And as we see, the uh, NLP has been helping the new form of learning which has emerged, which is through streaming platforms, which is exactly the platform that I'm using right now to communicate with all of you. The second application of NLP is NLP and literature. For example, you could actually download uh, this uh, download the transcript of uh, of a literary work. In the paper that I show on the left, they used the transcript of Mahabharat, the Indian epic, and they performed emotion analysis of characters of Mahabharat. And that's what you see along the bar charts there. They have divided it into four chunks. Bhishma, Dhritarashtra, Drona, and Krishna. And they show how these characters in Mahabharat reflect different kinds of emotions. Similarly, a more recent paper from ACL 2022 uses, uh, uh, uses information retrieval, specifically semantic information retrieval, to understand which quotes from books need to be picked up in order to be included in the essay. So for example, what you see in the first step here is a paragraph that somebody has written, critically analyzing the book Pride and Prejudice, and the model learns to pull out the relevant quote, which will support the author's hypothesis. So this is essentially helping the author write an essay or a research paper using a literary work. And NLP models, specifically Roberta in this case, can be used in order to achieve this. The third application of NLP is slightly different. It is in terms of the medical domain. This work on the left was something I was involved in as a part of my postdoc at CSIRO in Sydney. So this work was about social media based epidemic intelligence. People use Twitter and other social media all the time where they tweet about a lot of personal things. And sometimes these personal things are actually symptom reports. So you might just tweet saying, oh, I'm coughing since morning and so on. What we did here was we implemented this dashboard called Watch the Flu, which uses real time streams of tweets, predicts if these tweets are actually reports of uh, symptoms and maps them along body parts and, and the map of Australia, as you see on the right. So what this essentially shows is that in the state of Victoria, a lot of people were reporting headache around the time this snapshot was taken. This uh, dashboard can actually be used by epidemiologists in order to understand how people are reporting some of these illnesses and essentially use this to augment the information that they have coming from hospitals. This paper was reported in January 2020. And as you can probably imagine, some of this work turned out to be useful in months and years that followed. The second part of uh, the, the second kind of NLP in medical domain work that I would like to talk about is summarization of medical papers. So NLP has actually also been used to summarize medical papers because doctors often do not have time to read about advancements in medicine and therefore NLP techniques can combine information from different papers and create a summary for the for the medical professional. And this paper that you see from ACL 2022 does exactly that. As an extension of NLP in the medical domain, I, I thought it would be useful to talk about how NLP applications during the COVID-19 pandemic developed. In fact, in the footnote on the right, you'll see that NLP conferences actually hosted workshops where NLP was being applied to COVID. So that really became a theme of many recurring workshops in 2020 where several workshops on NLP for COVID-19 were conducted, where people reported different kinds of data sets and approaches. So the first approach that I, I would like to talk about is COVID misinformation detection, where this paper 
creates a labeled data set and then presents a model to essentially detect if the tweet agrees with the misconception or not. So if you read this tweet, coronavirus was a top secret biological warfare experiment and the misconception is coronavirus is genetically engineered. The label is that the misconception agrees with the tweet. And therefore, the goal of this particular model was to understand how misinformation is being spread about COVID across different social media channels. And the second kind of uh, uh, NLP, uh, NLP and COVID-19 applications that I would talk about is in terms of the emotion detection. So the COVID worry data set was actually a very popular data set which, uh, re uh, which, which was uh, introduced. So this data set, had two kinds of text. The first one was a long text, which was around 500 characters minimum. And the second one was short text, which was about 240 characters. And these data sets allowed people to report how they were feeling during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the COVID-19 real world worry data set, as I mentioned, has been used in several works to understand the emotional impact of pandemic on people around the world. NLP has also been applied to the legal domain. Interestingly, this paper uh, that I've mentioned here shows an overview of how NLP can be used for legal applications, where it could be in terms of symbol-based method, where you, where, where you represent sentences in the form of relations, and then apply different NLP problems such as judgment, prediction, question answering, and so on. Modern methods using embeddings have also been implemented here where you, you have pre-trained language models on legal documents, knowledge graphs, which capture a structured meaning of words, etc. But there are two things which I want to particularly mention when I talk about NLP in the legal domain. The first thing is ethical considerations. A lot of research in particularly judgment prediction using NLP has been criticized and in a good measure, rightly so, for Oh, uh, for, for exaggerating existing biases in historical data sets. Because models are trained on historical data, they reflect biases which were present in the past and therefore ethical considerations in terms of NLP in the legal domain are extremely important because they affect people's lives directly. The second thing which I want to talk about is actually an opportunity. If you imagine, India is a multilingual country where different courts actually have different languages. A district court sometimes operates in a language that is different from a state court. And a state co and the state courts of different states operate in different languages as compared to, say, the Supreme Court. And therefore, for applying NLP in the legal domain in India, what we are really working with here is multilingual data sets. And there's a lot of opportunity of using multilingual NLP there. And finally, the last set of applications that I would like to talk about are NLP for social good, because I think these are the applications which truly highlight the positive utility of NLP that I started off with. The first one is a deployment of an NLP application in Indonesia. So in Indonesia, they have this uh, page called Peta Bengkana, where essentially people self-report flooding around the city, specifically Jakarta. So essentially people around Jakarta, when they have flooding in their area, they write a tweet and they include it in, include a certain handle, which performs information extraction to be able to place it on a map so that people get to know which parts of Jakarta have seen flooding and have experienced flooding. So this has actually helped the government and also the people to understand what kind of measures they need to take in different parts. As you see, the, this particular illustration shows that there have been flooding in, there have been lots of reports of flooding in these parts of Jakarta, etc. And therefore, this application of NLP for social good actually is also featured on Twitter's homepage sure. as a really landmark application in the context of NLP for social good. The second kind of the second kind of application that I would like to talk about is fake news detection, where this particular uh, paper from Colling 2018 uses legitimate and fake news as two parallel corpora in order to understand which of them is yeah. fake. In order to do that, they created a data set where they modified certain sentences from legitimate news 
and created a fake news. So for example, Nintendo Switch Game Console to launch in March for 299 was changed to new Nintendo Switch Game to launch for 99, for example, which is still incorrect news. Similarly, NLP for social good can also be seen in terms of hate speech detection, which is something we tried to do in our paper from ICON 2018, where we talked about Hindi English code mixed tweets. And this is one application of NLP that I would like to uh, mention here, where people in India often mix words of different languages. So people could say, Ye idiot log hamesha aise hi nuisance create karte rehte hain, which is a hateful speech. Where, whereas many aaj breakfast kaya is not a hateful tweet. And therefore, in this paper, we presented an approach which performs hate speech detection in order to detect if a given tweet is hateful towards a target group or individual. Finally, I would like to call out NLP for productivity, where I worked on this app, which was called Notive. And Notive allows us to transcribe meetings, specifically Zoom meetings, and extract action item sentences from there. So essentially, if you attend a long meeting and you were too bored or you slept through it, Notive uses NLP to create a summary of what happened during the meeting and creates these topics, creates action items for you to act upon and so on. So this was the first part of this presentation where I talked about different applications. I really brushed through these applications, but hopefully the picture that emerges is this. NLP applications can be visualized along three dimensions. There's an application domain in terms of law, medicine, social good. These, these were really the titles of the slides that I used in, in, the, in the previous slides. But underlying these titles were NLP problems, which was sentiment analysis, summarization, and so on. So essentially, in the previous slides, everything I talked about was some NLP formulation applied to some domain. And this is the balance that NLP applications need to strike. And in order to use these NLP problems in the particular application domain, they may use different kinds of data sets. So you may use social media posts, you may use say legal documents, medical papers, and so on. And therefore, when we look at NLP applications, we should be looking at these three dimensions of NLP applications. So this, this was the end of the first part where I, gave an overview of different NLP applications. Now with this background, let's really try to see what are the typical steps to build an NLP application. So if, if one has to undertake an NLP application project, either for research or a smaller thesis or dissertation or so on, what are typical steps that you can use to build an NLP application? And in this part, I'm really going to leverage on a lot that we have discussed in the past in order to give you a very simple four step formula. And this is no, I mean, this is definitely uh, not a prescribed or a defined framework. This is just something which I developed in terms of my understanding of NLP applications. So the first step is to understand what is your idea. And when we talk about what is your idea, I think it is useful to ask, quest ask questions like, who will it help? Which non NLP experts do I need to consult? which means that you may want to reach out to epidemiologists when you're working on say a, 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 an epidemic intelligence kind of a project. The third question which one must be mindful of when working on NLP applications is who can it harm? Does the project that you're about to implement unfairly bias against certain people by disadvantaging them? And that is something that you need to think about when you're fleshing out the idea for your NLP project. The second step that one needs to think about is where will the data come from? In that sense, one needs to look at are there labeled data sets available online? And there are lots of online resources or shared tasks, for example, or benchmarks in NLP, which provide publicly available data sets. So if you have an idea and you want to look, for about, look at how to implement the idea, it may be useful to look uh, to search for shared tasks in the past, which have implemented or implemented parts of this idea. And you can actually Google some of these terms with your idea in order to discover the data sets. And you might just find some labeled data sets. But the second question is, if you don't find a labeled data set or if it's not large enough, can you create your own data set? 
And to create your own data set, it is possible to say use APIs of crawlers, which you can use legitimately in some cases. And then you need to look at how do you label it? How do you obtain the labels required for the idea that you're about to implement? And finally, once you have created your data set, it is also important to consider if you can make it publicly available for research. I think this is extremely important because it allows others to leverage on the knowledge that you have built, which is extremely crucial. And I think at the heart of all things research. So once you have your idea and you have created your data set, the third step is pretty obvious. Look at the approach. And the approach here, here would essentially be in terms of modeling it as an NLP problem, because this is now the second axis of the three perspective diagram that I showed. And therefore you could model your idea as say a classification or a generation problem or identify other related NLP problems. In terms of NLP application papers, there are two kinds of perspectives that one sees in terms of approaches. You could either examine existing LMs to identify problems, or you could train your own model based on language model in order to implement your idea. To, 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 be, to, be, to be very concrete about these two perspectives, I have two examples on the next slide. So what this essentially means is when you are implementing your NLP application, if you are trying to uh, publish it as a paper, then there are typically two kinds of papers that you observe. The paper on the left does not implement a new model. The paper on the left uses existing pre-trained pre LMs, BART and long form, long former, and essentially uses them to generate summaries and examines how good these summaries are in terms of the claims that they make. So they only examine pre-trained models in terms of goodness for the idea that they are trying to implement. In contrast, the paper on the right uses language model-based training and what they do in this case is they use text containing news about companies and prices of company stocks. And together they train a classifier which predict if the person is ex expressing a positive or a negative sentiment towards a particular target in the sentence. So for example, if somebody said X company is terrible and the stock prices also went down, then it is a stronger indicator for the model to learn that probably the person does not like this particular company. And once you have the NLP approach, which is one of these two methods or something else, you can evaluate and deploy it either as a dashboard. So I'll remind you of the dashboard that we had in terms of um, the social media mining pipeline, or you could perform qualitative or quantitative evaluation where you present results. And finally, you could also monitor the dashboard. So we, in the, at the end of the first part, we saw that NLP applications have three dimensions. At the end of the second part, what we have is a typical workflow for an NLP application project. So if you want to implement an NLP application project on your own, the first step would be to develop an understanding around the concept. What is the idea? Who will it help? Who can it harm? Who are the experts that I can collaborate with? The second step is data. Where do I get my data from? Can it be unstructured, structured? For example, medical, uh, medical NLP often uses lots of structured data sets in the form of knowledge bases, knowledge graphs, because a lot of medical knowledge has been encoded in structured resources, such as ontologies. And therefore medical NLP often leverages on these structured resources. Once you have the data sets, the third step is approach and evaluation where you have simple baselines, multi-perspective evaluation, and essentially the two kinds of NLP approaches that I talked about, where you use existing pre-trained models or you also fine tune some of them for the task that you're trying to solve. So with this typical workflow, I'm going to go ahead with the third part, which I had planned because I think I have some time which is our story of an NLP application. So this third part is a very light story. And this third part describes a paper that uh, 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 I published during my PhD uh, many years ago. And therefore the method in this paper is not, not and not the state of the art in NLP. However, what I really want to highlight in this third part is how we use the three-step framework that I just talked about in order to develop a particular research application. 
right? So I presented a three-step framework in this diagram. I'm just going to show how it was put into action in 2015 for a paper that we worked on. So the title of this particular NLP application was Automatic Prediction of Drunk Texting. This was a paper published in ACL 2015 with Abhijit Balamurli and my PhD advisors, Pushpak Bhattacharya and Mark Kamen. So what is drunk texting? Drunk texting is to predict if a given tweet was written under the influence of alcohol. So this was our concept. Our concept was we want to show if we can apply NLP to detect whether a person is writing a tweet when they are drunk. With this concept in mind, we tried to develop a motivation. Who wants to, I mean, why are we doing this? Who can it help? And we realized that alcohol abuse can lead to unsociable behavior. And there were papers which talked about the links of alcohol abuse with aggression, crime, risky sexual behavior, privacy leaks, and so on. And so we thought that this approach that we were trying to build can actually help uh, regretful drunk text help, help to prevent regretful drunk texting or investigation following an episode. And in fact, it was around that time that Google had implemented this approach where if you're trying to send an email on a Friday at 5 p.m., if I'm not wrong, so essentially around the time when you are susceptible to being drunk, Google would ask you to solve strange math problems, like two or three math problems. And if you're able to solve them, your email gets sent, otherwise it gets paused until you feel better and you're sure you want to send it. So essentially what we were trying to do here was use NLP to do the same thing, detect if a tweet was written under the influence of alcohol. And we thought it could help in the ways as shown in this slide. So the next step for us was data. How are we going to get the data? Obtaining labeled data, uh, uh, obtaining labeled samples was a challenge. And therefore we used this method called distant supervision. So what we essentially did was we downloaded tweets containing hashtags hash drunk and hash not drunk. And we also downloaded other tweets by the people who were reporting being drunk. And therefore, the data set that we created was using the Twitter API and we used what is called as self-reporting. And this idea of self-reporting is very commonly used in medical NLP, for example, because only a person who is in a current state can give you the best information about whether or not they are in that state. How reliable is it is a question. Is there a confirmatory bias? Is there a bias in terms of the population? Yes, absolutely. We acknowledge that. But to start with, we had a data set which was annotated with drunk and sober tweets. So once we had that in place, we implemented a bunch of features, which I think is the only aspect of this work which is not state of the art. Otherwise, the methodology that we followed was is pretty much what continues in recent NLP papers. So we mapped it to the corresponding NLP problem. So we said that this whole drunk texting thing, we're gonna convert it to a classification task. So the input is a text, a tweet, and the output is whether or not it is a drunk tweet. And we looked at current techniques and we observed that qualitative features using n-grams and stylistic features could be useful. So we implemented them. We had some results. But that's really not the focus of what I'm talking about. What I'm really saying is once we had implemented our idea in terms of the NLP application and had the data set, we had to look at how well it was performing. So we compared it with certain versions of the own of its own baseline, which you see in the which you see in the table here. And we observed that combining the features actually did best in the case of data set two, but not so well in terms of data set one. And therefore, we thought of this additional evaluation, which I think is very critical and very typical of NLP applications. NLP applications are often centered around trying to help someone. And therefore, we tried to see, we tried to think of who were we helping? We were helping humans who were trying to judge if a given tweet was written by a drunk user or not. And therefore, we, we created a held out data set and we got human annotators to annotate the held out data sets with drunk or not. Human annotators were able to perform it with 68.8% accuracy, which means human annotators were able to detect drunkenness 68% times, roughly speaking, whereas the model was able to do it 64%. So our claim was that we were getting close to what could be considered a human accuracy in the context of this held out data set. 
So as you see, we really followed the four step process without really spelling it out as such. And therefore, in today's talk, I talked about applications of NLP, and this really brings us to almost the end of this presentation. In the first part, we looked at the application areas in context of NLP in education technology, NLP in literature, medicine, law, social good. We looked at typical steps to build an NLP application. There were four steps, the concept, data, approach, and evaluation. And finally, I tried to demonstrate how these steps are actually put into action by telling you a story of an NLP application paper that I worked on long ago, which was trunk texting prediction. That's it from me. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Aditya. I think there's uh, somebody that could be. Yeah, there's a noise coming from the background. OK. Yeah, so uh, thanks a lot, Aditya. It was a very interesting talk, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I also have a few questions to ask. So first, uh, let me see if uh, any other participants want to ask a question. Uh, are there any questions? So uh, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Or uh, you can, you know, uh, raise a hand. Or maybe you can, uh, you know, write in the chat window. I think that will be good. We can have uh, any questions. Just write them in the chat window and uh, we can address them one by one. I think until there are uh, more questions, I have a few uh, questions uh, that occurred to me. So, uh, so the uh, question is about uh, the way these NLP applications can be developed. So, uh, the various applications that you mentioned, right, are they developed in a siloed manner? Like, do you have to do the whole exercise from scratch, or is there a, a uh, NLP tool that is available which can be applied in different contexts, like for example, to generate images like in DALI or uh, you know to take an action or to respond to queries, uh, where it works like a single tool which can be, uh, let's say, uh, to understand uh, in the English language and applied in different uh, contexts. That's, that's a great question. That's a great question. Sure, sure. That's a great question. I'll try to answer that. So there are. Uh, there are off the shelf or black box NLP libraries that you can use. Some of these libraries, uh, I mean, some of the older libraries are called Stanford NLP or NLTK, which are very popular NLP tools. They are more, they, they, they provide models for the more linguistic oriented research problems. However, Hugging Face and similar uh, uh, online repositories, they have, they provide models via the Transformers library where you can download these models. So essentially, if you want to test out named entity recognition on a particular niche data set for your application domain, you can actually model, you can actually download one of their one of their models which are available publicly and use them directly. In the context of Indian languages, there's also this uh, project called the Indic NLP project, which provides um, a, a, a portal to upload data sets and models for several Indian language tasks if that is the scope of your project. So I think with a lot of pre-trained models and fine-tuned models available in these repositories, such as Arguing Face, it has become way more easier to you know, try out NLP techniques for the problem that you're working on. I hope that answers yeah. your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Aditya. Are there any uh, other questions? Please feel free to write the questions into the chat window. Is there any questions? Hello. Uh, hi, Aditya. Uh, nice talk. Uh, this is Clint uh, okay, from IIT Goa. So uh, I have one quick question. So uh, so when you build uh, this NLP applications, uh, so how do you usually evaluate? So evaluation is a, uh, is a challenge, right? So what are your uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good point. I think uh, evaluation can be done either using a held out label set which is pretty like which is the first step. However, sometimes evaluation 
in, at least in terms of papers as reported in NLP conferences, evaluation is also done in terms of surveys of the final stakeholders, which is why I thought it was in, uh, useful to add the experts in the diagram that I had. So in order to evaluate your NLP application, you might actually give it in the hands of your end users, a set of your end users and get say survey results from them. Ask them how useful it's going to be, et cetera. So qualitative surveys like these can help to evaluate the NLP application as such. NLP applications can also be evaluated in terms of case studies. So for example, this whole social media mining project that I had. So this was my postdoc where we implemented social media mining for epidemic intelligence. And we evaluated, in, evaluated it in terms of a held out data set where we said, hey, precision was whatever, X percent. But we also evaluated it in terms of a historical data set. So we knew that a thunderstorm asthma event had happened in Melbourne, which means that due to a thunderstorm, a lot of people experienced asthma. So we downloaded tweets around that period and we ran it through our pipeline and really tried to see if the pipeline returned any results as it should have. And that did. So that was a, a third way of examining or evaluating how well the application was doing. So to summarize, to evaluate NLP applications, you may look at label data set. You may use case studies as in the case of the thunderstorm asthma data set, or you could use surveys with the actual end users to see how well the application is performing. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks Clint and uh, Aditya. Are there any other questions? You can just write in the chat. Yeah, there's one question here in the chat window. Sure. By Yash. Yes. Hi, Yash. I'll read out your question. Have you tried new word embedding techniques on your trunk, not trunk data? If yes, did that improve the accuracy of models? That's a great question. Uh, no, we did not try it. It was it was that particular paper was something we did in 2015, and uh, so we have not tried it out. I'm almost sure it'll be useful. However, I'm not familiar with the current uh, state of the art in trunk texting prediction. I imagine it's not a very popular NLP application, but I, I know that there are papers in the field. So maybe you, you can just take a look at that. And if you want to discuss using word embeddings on drunk, on drunk data and how it can help, you can actually get in touch with me. I would be happy to discuss it with you. And I'm trying to go to the last slide where I have my email. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yes, yes, that's a that's a great question. In fact, I, I was thinking that uh, detecting depression can be a very related, similar problem from tweets. And Absolutely, uh, IIT Patna has some recent research papers on detecting depression, suicidality using text written by people, especially tweets. For example, you rely on the hashtags written by the Twitter user themselves, right? If I understand correctly. Yep. Uh, of the people who actually text while drunk, very few of them will actually put the hashtag. Uh, so that's a challenge here. Oh yes, absolutely. But so I think one, yeah, that's that's a very valid point. So so a, so a nicer way. So you know, the, the the paper that I described was done in 2015. If you ask me what is a nicer way to do it, I would actually incorporate the suggestion that you just made. Yeah, where we start with the data set, where we use self reports that is tweets which contain these uh, these hashtags we train a model but we also then expand this data set to select high confidence instances which do not have the hashtag and we retrain the model for example so that would break the dependency on self reports and hopefully uncover other forms of drunkenness or drunk reporting so uh, if it's okay uh, you know if are there any other questions? So please feel free there's to a ask. Question. Yeah, there's that. a question by Deepavesh. I'll read it out. How much inter-annotator agreement is important when it comes to labeling the data set? That's a good point, Deepavesh. And uh, so there are well-known uh, there are well-known metrics. The one that comes to my mind is called Fleiss's Kappa. Fleiss is the name of the person. And uh, they give, they, I mean, there are well-understood levels of what these values mean. So, I mean, you know, they, so there are well-defined descriptions of what these numbers mean in terms of what does 0 0.8 to 1 inter annotator agreement mean, what does 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 mean, etc. I remember that for the... How, how usually people like 
um, use this inter honorator agreement while presenting results in their paper. Or... Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. So the so inter annotator agreement is useful in two ways. I think inter annotator agreement is useful in this in first in determining if your data set is good enough. Yeah. Because if you are going to use your annotators to annotate five thousand tweets, if you have two annotators and you are going to take their help to annotate five thousand tweets each, inter annotator agreement between them will tell you how reliable your annotation is. If they have a high annotator inter annotator agreement, it means that your data set is reliable. The second benefit of inter annotator agreement, which is often not understood very well or appreciated very well, which I think is important in the context of NLP applications, is inter annotator agreement uncovers how well defined your problem is. Yeah. How easy, how well defined your problem is. A low inter annotator agreement actually shows that maybe you have not defined the labeling yeah. task clearly yeah. enough, or the problem is not defined clearly enough, right? So, for example, I'll go back to the example that uh, Neha mentioned. If we are try, if the if the task is to use a tweet to detect if a person is depressed or not, then people without medical background will actually, in my understanding, not perform very well unless the tweet is really obviously very negative. And therefore, inter-annotator agreement uncovers the quality of your idea or the concept, which was the first step that I talked about. Yeah. That's, that's it. Low, I hope it answers your question. Yeah, and low inter-annotator agreement also conveys, like can convey, uh, we cannot rely on the model evaluations basically like value may not be, be correct yeah the value may not be correct yeah that's right however i would also i would uh, that's a good point and that i mean the point that you made right now Deepavish, reminds me of the fact that inter annotator agreement in fundamental nlp tasks is very high so for example you can imagine that if the task is part of speech tagging yeah then two annotators are very likely to agree with each other. If something is a noun, it is it is a noun, given that they have similar linguistic competencies. But if you are talking about an NLP application, it is well understood that the inter-annotator agreement is not as high as it is in the case of fundamental NLP tasks. Yeah. Because these problems are not deter as deterministic as, say, post tagging. Thank you. Thank you, Vitavish. I have a question. Karan asks, are there any ways to reduce the inherent bias that comes to the output, the one that you mentioned in the story selection, in order to enhance its reliability? I'm not sure in the story section. Sorry. Uh, what is the story section? Oh, uh, the story section is the drunk texting prediction. Okay. So are there any ways to reduce the inherent bias that comes in the output? Inherent bias. Okay, now let me examine your uh, question again, Karan. Your question is, in the drunk texting prediction work, can I think of ways to reduce the inherent bias that comes in the output in order to enhance its reliability? The inherent bias in terms of the data set is that we need to believe people when they are saying they're drunk. The bias is also in the case where people may not always use the drunk hashtag. I am not sure I can immediately think of ways to reduce the inherent bias, but if I had to do it, I would probably rely on medical experts to provide additional inputs or use information from say the person's Twitter bio in order to get additional information about them so that I'm better informed about the person. So these are two ways in which I can think of reducing inherent bias in some NLP applications. So for example, when I was working on the NLP for social media epidemic intelligence work, we were closely working with, uh, with epidemiologists and uh, medical experts. I hope that answers your question, yes. Okay, Karan says yes, I'm happy, thank you. That's a great question. I think uh, unlike a human that looks at one tweet at a time and decides whether it's drunk or not, 
the agent can look at the past history and several other indicators uh, presence on social media everything else to make a decision and that can i think certainly help and that's something a human can't do to look at so much data at a single time so in that sense it will be i think a, it's a good very good question here thanks absolutely absolutely and that's actually also data set too in this uh, in this work where we looked at positive tweets coming from people who have reported being drunk and negative tweets for other tweets by the same users where we were hoping to discover some of these properties thank you aditya thank you so much for the talk today thanks sorry i'm not sure who this is sorry hi this is maria here from ecm goa hi hi maria thank you thanks so much so ashweta asks a question and i hope we have time for this question we do right it's 4:52 so i'll read out the question thanks ashweta uh, the question is is there a way to measure how good our data set is yes so inter annotator agreement is one mechanism to measure how good the data set is it may also be useful to make sure that our data set covers different forms of representative examples and this is a this is an emerging trend in nlp where essentially if you are so to give the example of uh, drunkenness to be sure that your data set is good enough you want to ensure that it covers a wide range of topics in which drunkenness may be exp expressed so for for example when people are drunk they may express heightened sense of uh, being emotional when people are drunk they might be angry when people are drunk they might talk about certain things etc so another way to measure how good the data set is to is to examine how well it represents the different use case scenarios and in that sense i think just just a i mean this is just a brain fart i'm not sure i've not thought this through but in order to measure how good your data set is it might be useful to use lda or topic models in order to examine what kind of themes are emerging from the data set that you just downloaded and created thank you yeah so i think uh, if there are any more questions please uh, enter in the chat window uh i request maria to uh, thank the speaker and uh, introduce a chapter also to the people who are attending for the first time to this event maria yes, is there half yes yes thank you nita so on behalf of goa acm chapter i would like to thank our speaker for today aditya joshi the talk was uh, very amazing yeah thank you for thank you for sharing your time with us and um, on the coa acm front we had a few activities uh, we had the acm w all india hackathon that was organized uh, this uh, recent this month recently at uh, pcc college we had around 13 top teams participate and for the top spot so i would like to thank uh, coa college st patrick of pcc college for organizing this as well as to all the members of coa acm chapter who helped in organizing this event we have a few uh, competitions that are upcoming we will uh, we would be having a local uh, hackathon for all the colleges in goa uh, to prep them for such competitions we have organized a few talks in the past though we had a few gaps as neha mentioned but we're looking forward to many of you participating and providing talks to our students okay thank you thanks, thanks maria good yeah and thanks so much aditya for giving a very engaging uh, talk and uh, i i hope that you know those people who want to reach out to you for any uh, further guidance or questions can do so um, okay. i think uh, yeah so i look forward to seeing you all for the future acm uh, goa events uh, thanks for attending the event today bye everyone